Hey, hey, everybody, what's up? It's your boy MJ, and welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today for Before the Poor, aka 20 Questions of MJ, is wine expert, sommelier, and founder of Thatcher's Wine Consulting, Thatcher Baker Briggs. He has made a career of stepping outside his comfort zone, always pushing himself to learn and master something new. His professional trajectory boasts key positions in kitchens and dining rooms of some of the most influential restaurants in the world, including then three Michelin-starred Saison under Chef Joshua Skeins, uh, also at the highly regarded Takazawa in Tokyo, and at two-star Michelin Kwa in San Francisco. It was in these distinguished training grounds that he gained the knowledge, tools, and the reach to curate highly specialized wine services for collectors around the globe. And in April of 2019, he launched Thacker's Wine Consulting, an advisory and seller management service for wine collectors and enthusiasts. In addition to sourcing rare wines, he takes great care in helping clients fill, refine, and organize their sellers. With his consulting business based in the United States, Switzerland, and Asia, Thacker's clients are leaders in a wide range of industries, including technology, publishing, financing, politics, and sports. Get that research tight, and sports. <laughs> uh, welcome, Thatcher. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think you covered it all. I'm super excited. Thanks for, uh, for having me here. Well, uh, we're, we're excited for you to be here, man. So, um, you know, here's how we do this. We warm up. We do this thing. It's called 20 Questions with MJ. I'm going to ask you uh, some personal questions, followed by James Lipton's famous 10 questions from inside the actor's studio. Okay, cool. All right. <clears throat> so the key is just answer them quickly. Whatever comes to your mind, uh, it's not a test. We will make fun of these later, but Great. don't worry about that. I'm ready. I'm okay, ready. you ready? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's your favorite book? Uh, favorite book on food and cooking from Harold McGee. Oh, nice. Yeah. I have to look that one up. I need a. My wife loves cooking and cookbooks, and so I'll get her that one. On your recommendation? It's been my favorite for since forever. Yeah. It's never he, changed. First of all, he's so young that the baby face. It's been my forever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, tw uh, like uh, since okay. it came out, twenty years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> since I since I was five. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's your favorite movie? Forrest Gump. Oh, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah. It really is a good one. It's one of those that like, um, if it's on network TV, I'll even watch it sometimes. Oh, I'll, you I'm, know, I fly a lot, so I've, pro I've probably seen it like a thousand <laughs> times. Yeah, it never gets old. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't. Okay, who's your favorite musical artist? <sighs> Oof, Al Green. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, bro, yeah. bro's an old soul here. Absolutely. I love that, yep. man. I love that. What's your favorite Al Green song, if you have one? Oof. The remix that he did by the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Oh, wow. For me, it's a perfect song. Okay. And, I, and I love the Beatles, but for me, that song is really, that is my favorite song. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> All right. Um, I lo I, he said an Al Green Beatles remix. What the fuck? <laughs> That's dope. I mean, <laughs> it's just, a, you know, I have sometimes, I'm like, be present in the conversation, MJ. <laughs> All right. Um, what's your favorite food? Uh, death row, last meal. What What are you having? Sushi. Okay. Ha hands down. Easy choice. Very cool. Uh, who is your favorite athlete? Oof. Michael Jordan. Mm? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't, you, I, you know, I don't know. We don't have to put these out, but I, I don't like Michael Jordan because I was in New York. Yeah. And the, the Knicks could not get past him. <laughs> that, yeah. So fuck Michael Jordan. Right. I seriously? Get it. I get it. It's just, it's just, I mean, I've wanted, I mean, he's so great, but shit. Like, yeah. he kept Patrick from a fucking ring. Also, no, it goes deeper than that. Oh, yeah. Tell me. North Carolina. Oh, Georgetown. <laughs> yeah. 1980 fucking two. Oh, yeah. Fucking freshman. Yeah. Fuck that guy. <laughs> I was a Donovan Bailey fan, too. For a long time. Oh, Donovan Bailey's dope. I yeah. ran track. Yeah, I'm not mad too. at Donovan Bailey. Me too. Yeah, me too. yeah, yeah. But Michael's a great ball player. But it's just like George. I was a George. I was an East Coast guy. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, you know. I understand. And Big East. So okay, I digress. This I got you. <laughs> um, what was your favorite cartoon? <sighs> Probably Arthur. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was my. That was probably. It. And somebody, and a really, really close friend of mine. We were just at dinner the other day, and she's just. She. We were having quite a bit of wine, and she's just like, "You look exactly like Arthur." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "I don't know if I'm like, if I like that." I know. It's like, like it's like. Dang. I mean, it's like. 
you know, well, you are definitely in the friend zone if you look like Arthur. <laughs> right. Just, yeah, so I know. You're, you're, you're it's squarely a, it's a fine, in the friend zone. <laughs> it's a slippery, slippery slope. <laughs> yeah, slippery slope. I mean, unless you, you know, if you said Ted, <laughs> you're <laughs> right. like, I'm more like Ted than like Arthur. Ted. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, what was your favorite cereal? Oh, man. Cheerios, Honey Nut, just classic. Okay, just Yeah, simple. nothing nothing too fancy. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, what do you do for exercise? What's your current exercise routine? Um, been doing a lot in-house. Obviously, gyms been, have been closed. I used to run a lot, um, used to cycle a lot. Now, just doing, like, weights in the living room or if there's a gym when I'm traveling or something like that, but four or five times a, uh, a week. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, who's your favorite comedian? That's a good, that's a hard one. I mean, uh, Eddie Murphy is hilarious. Mm -hmm. I, I like his leather uh, leather, uh, the leather, <laughs> outfits, leather outfits. I can't, I can't believe he wore <laughs> that shit. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, I think Kevin Hart is hilarious. Mm. I, I like that he's he has really clean humor, which I think is really funny. Obviously, Dave Chappelle. Um, yeah. But those are top three for me yeah. for sure. Kevin Hart. Yeah. It's 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 funny you said. I was thinking about him the other day because he's risen. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do you remember back to like he was in uh, the Forty Year Old Virgin, mm -hmm. like a, a bit part? Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. like, let me just hook me up with that for the amount of free, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, and he was like a bit player, and like right. he's bigger than all those guys. Yeah, now. he's huge. It's it's it's, it's insane huge, how yeah. um, it goes to work ethic, though. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, who would you most like to have a bottle of wine with? Uh -huh. Quincy Jones. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I would love to hang out with Quincy Jones. Like he's, I don't, I don't really idolize a lot of like celebrities and things like that. But for me, I just think he's done so much, and we don't even, we don't even know. No, exactly. I mean, like I just found out uh, a couple months ago. Like I watched the documentary his daughter did about him, Rashida did about him. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I, oh, I mean, it, it kind of, it didn't dawn on me he was fucking Frank Sinatra's bandly all the time, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. Just, like you just think Michael Jackson and Tevin, like right. it was, you know, or yeah. you know. Uh, you know all the careers he launched, and but it's then incredible. all the movies he scored. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's bananas. Um, and didn't Marquita knew him, right? Marquita did a yeah. Marquita, one of Marquita Levy. She did. She okay. was at an event and she met him. She said he was amazing. Just, yeah, uh, just yeah. That type of person who just um, is dope like that. One of my friends, he uh, he's a he's an ankle doctor, and so we I, I went to go see him uh, a little while ago. And we were just talking, and he just so casually was like. Oh, like last week I had lunch with Quincy Jones, and I was just like, I'm like, what? Like, why is why is Quincy Jones having lunch with, with you? Doctor. You should have lunch with me. I'm like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you could have let me know. I would have just poured the wine. Or exactly. Yeah, right? yeah. Exactly. Totally. Okay. Now we're gonna get into uh, the questions that James Lipton made famous on Inside the Actors Studio. That's why my voice has changed. Done my best, James Lipton. Thatcher, what is your favorite word? I mean, is I gotta say yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's always a good thing to hear. Yeah, love it, <laughs> love it. Um, <clears throat> what is your least favorite word? No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm pretty simple. In yeah. Okay. Regard, this is, this is, yeah. I'm not. This is, uh, when someone says no, I like to figure out why they're saying no, mm -hmm. and it plays a lot into my career. Um, but I've always chased it. Like no to me has never. And you, ev anybody that knows me, I've always been like, like, but like why? Why is it no? Mm -hmm. What can we do to make it a yes? Mm -hmm. You know, try to chase that. And so, yeah, I hate that word. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like that. Um, what turns you on? Uh, an amazing bottle of wine. Uh, good smile, good teeth. Uh, good smell, for sure. <laughs> 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 a perfect piece of sushi. There you go. Yeah. I love it. Some Al Green. There you go. <laughs> It's all coming together. <laughs> it's all coming. Uh, you see what, I know you where see this is happening. going. You see what's happening. I see where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, what turns you off? Um, inconsistency, inefficiency, um, just a, a, a lack of, of passion and push, mm. um, and 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 not and, and no hustle drives me. I, no drive. No drive. It kills Don't me. Don't you? I, I, yeah, I, I get that. I totally like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gonna, gonna, yeah, we could go deep. <laughs> on yeah, we this. go deep, we on, that go way, deep yeah. on this. Yeah, I'm sure it'll come up during the podcast. Proper. Okay. Um, what sound or noise do you love? 
Um, that's a good question. Um, I love I love the sound of searing meat mm. um, or grilling meat mm-hmm. has always kind of um, done it for me. And there's also this there's also this like pop um, when you pull the cork on a bottle mm-hmm. that I'm just like, oh yeah, it's time. <laughs> <laughs> it's on. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, what sound or noise do you hate? Uh, doors closing, like loudly slamming, mm. drives me nuts. Um, mm-hmm. That like, like a, like a, just like a constant clinking, just drives me drives me crazy. I can, can I can sometimes like space it out, but like eventually I'm like, wait, what, what's going on here? What's the problem? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, what's your favorite curse word? Oh, that's a good one. I gotta say, I gotta say, I gotta say, fuck. You got yeah, to. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, there, and, y- and you can say it in a tone that's like, what the fuck, like that. Right, like right, y- right. It like just, you the know. tone, right. intonation, <laughs> place, and play. It, it has. It, it's. Uh, I know shit about English, uh, but it's every type of thing you could have. Right. Adverb, verb. Exactly. You know, yeah. dangling participle. It's every. It can be right. everything. Yeah, it can. It literally can be. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's so versatile. <laughs> it's it's a it's an omnipresent and an omnipotent curse word. It's true. It's it's actually the ombudsman of fucking profanity, <laughs> if you will. I don't know where it's coming. You it's know kind me. of a perfect word, really, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, I mean, I think it'd be pretty cool to be a pilot. <laughs> um, you know, travel around the world. You got a pilot's name too. You got pilot good looks. <laughs> you know. He's like six two. He's good looking. He's like you know, and you can see you know yeah. the, the <laughs> aviators yeah. and like Baker Briggs on the tag. What's the movie? Uh, yeah. If you catch me, if you can, Leonardo. Yeah, DiCaprio, right, right, you know, right. He like walked like to the airport <laughs> with all the girls. Yeah, exactly. Totally. <laughs> could do that. Um, <clears throat> and just like you could have been in Top Gun, Thatcher, right? Like you don't even need a handle. You don't even need Iceman. Just, just, just Thatcher. Just Thatcher. Yeah. Yeah. What's I, don't, I don't. I don't need one. I don't need a call name. Thatcher. I, Thatcher. Yeah, I don't have any nicknames really. Like. <laughs> Thatch, you know, <laughs> that's, that's about it. Thatch. All right. <clears throat> what profession would you not like to do? <clears throat> um, that's a hard one. Um, I, I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't want to be a teacher. Oh, um, I really, I really respect the profession. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, but I don't. I don't know if I'm. I don't. I like. I wouldn't want to teach people <laughs> that's like i think people <laughs> you know it's a lot of responsibility yeah, it's hard you have to be like really yeah, patient yeah you're like why don't uh, you know yeah. this i, don't I understand. mean i mean and like i said I, and teaching i worked with teachers for years like eight years yeah i admire what they do so much yeah i don't think i um, could do it i couldn't do it um it's a lot of it's more responsibility than people and so many people so many parents found out how much responsibility during the pandemic oh yeah they were sure. like wow fuck. right and you, <laughs> you can't go to school. You like why? You know, and, and then like, because I worked in a high school, I would digress here. Like, you know, it was a shift where parents. When I was a kid, because I'm 53, like the, the teacher was right, not the kid. Now it was the parents. They were pa- back in the kid after the pandemic. Like, oh no, 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 my kid is my kid is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. so props to teachers, but I'm with you on that. Absolutely, one, yeah. You know, um, so much respect. Just yeah, just yeah, because then you like. I kind of said, we have to ask, because I, I was like, could you imagine, like, your kid goes to jail, like, what did I do wrong? Why is he in jail? Like, I'm sh- and I know right. teachers would do that. Yeah, like, yeah. to try and work with kids, because I worked in high school. You take kids in the house, feed them, and you're like, damn, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. They were just the cards are kind of stacked against them to all the teachers listening out there. For sure. For sure. And lastly, um, <laughs> if heaven exists, <clears throat> what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Hmm. That wine you selected for me was really good. <laughs> oh, <laughs> boom! Something like a le- mic drop. That's like the best answer. Like he's like he's like I got wine for God. Thatcher Consulting. That's God's firm. That's bro. where I get my wine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that was fun. And if you want more of Thatcher, and I know you do, make sure you tune into his episode of the Black Wine Guy Experience. Until then, you guys, peace. Hey everybody, what's up? It's your boy MJ and welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today is wine expert, sommelier, and founder of Thatcher's Wine Consulting, Thatcher Baker Briggs. 
Thatcher has made a career of stepping outside his comfort zone, always pushing himself to learn and master something new. His professional trajectory boasts key positions in kitchens and dining rooms of some of the most influential restaurants in the world, including then three-starred Saison under Chef Joshua Skanes. He also worked at the highly regarded Takozawa in Tokyo and at the two Michelin starred Kwa in San Francisco. It was in these distinguished training grounds that he gained the knowledge, tools, and the reach to curate highly specialized wine services for collectors around the globe. In April of 2019, he launched Thacker's Wine Consulting. It's an advisory and seller management service for wine collectors and enthusiasts. In addition to sourcing rare wines, he takes great care in helping clients fill, refine, and organize their wine cellars. With his consulting business based in the United States, Switzerland, and Asia, pretty much makes him a baller. Thatcher's clients are leaders in a wide range of industries, including technology, publishing, finance, politics, and sports. Welcome, Thatcher. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, man. I think you got everything. Thank you uh, for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Well, we're super excited you're here, man. Uh, I think I, I think you're on your way to Paris, and uh, yep. you, you, you stopped down just to fucking share some wine with me. So tell everybody, so, what wine are we sharing right now? Um, so one of my favorites, I've been a German Riesling fanatic for my entire career. Uh, so this is Keller, uh, 2016 Absurder. Uh, for me, it's it's my favorite wine that he makes, um, this tiny little plot, super old vines, but I just love the minerality of the wine. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people might say like G-Max is the wine, like yeah. it's, you know, but for me, Apps just hits in such a particular way. I just love that acidity all the way through. It's awesome. What does that name mean in German, Absurder? That's a good question. Because in my mind, I'm like, is it mean it's absurd? Like it's like the Nazi, like, it's like. <laughs> Let's go with that. Yeah, I'm, real, I'm go. like. <laughs> Ab- Absurka. It's absurd. I, I, it's w- <laughs> I know what it means, but I, I can't think of what it... That's okay. Yeah, so it will come to me, me in the middle it'll of... Come to you and you can shout it, it out. Yeah. And you're like, I know. And if not, I guarantee when I post this episode, somebody's going to be like, I know what that one is. Of so, course. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. So. It will come to me. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, for yeah, sure. Totally. Um, so, <laughs> um, super excited, man. Yeah, this is my second Keller. Um, and you're right. I do the minerality's on it. It's good. And just apricots and just... So, um, and I'm a little amped up for this one. I'm excited. Um, so, listen, let's start at the beginning. So, you are Canadian. I am. And I read in your bio that you grew up in Windsor. Yeah. I so, did. where's Windsor located for people? Right like across me? from Detroit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right across from Detroit. So, it's weird because it's like, um, it, so Windsor's super south. It cuts into, into Michigan. So, it's like more south than Seattle. Like, it's, it's on, it's almost. Uh, like almost Portland, if you will. Like okay. it's pretty south. Okay, so okay. Yeah, and it's and so it's not like what people think of Canada is like fo- like snowy mountains. It's not like that. It's just like it's like Detroit. And so you just uh, <laughs> you look <laughs> for anybody that grew up in Detroit, they, they know what, exactly what I mean. It's like <laughs> across the river, one mile, and you can see it. Oh shit! And when it's I grew really up close. there, yeah, it's super close. When I grew up, like we used American currency, and you know the borders were open, and and so you just kind of go back and forth and and whatnot. So yeah. That's where I'm from. Okay. So what kind of exposure to food and wine did you have growing up in the greater Detroit area? <laughs> uh, Coney dogs. Um, <laughs> you know, there wasn't, uh, you know, it, I didn't grow up in like a really food uh, family. Um, you know, I come from pretty humble beginnings, just me and my mom uh, and my grandparents really. And, uh, you know, my mom cooked, but like she didn't, she just cooked because she needed to, to cook, right? And um, I don't know what it was. I just kind of got interested. I I. Windsor is a super multicultural place. Okay. Um, like my grade school, my high school, like we closed for Ramadan because no one would go to school. It was like 80% Muslim. Wow. There was a huge Vietnamese population, uh, big Korean population, big um, sort of like uh, East African, a lot of Ethiopian, Eritrean. And um, so there was all these foods and I just grew up eating them and it was kind of interesting. Um, and so I just got more and more into it. and. I think probably around like seven, eight, like I was really interested in food and like always watching the Food Network. And then by maybe 10, 11, like I was like obsessed to the point where I would like try to convince my grandparents to drive four hours to Toronto because like I was like, I've heard of this fruit. Like, <laughs> can you drive me eight hours to go see if they have like a mango steen? And they're like, I don't even know what that is, you know? And, uh, and then I was just hooked and that was it. And so we would like, would be really nice and the only grandson at the time try to convince them and they would drive up and we'd like go buy spices and like it was so weird but I just I got hooked and once I did that was it I just knew that that's what I wanted to do 
Yeah, that's what I read in your bio that you knew that like by age ten you wanted to work in restaurants. Like, like how did you know that at such a young age? I, the, you know, the only other thing that like I kind of dabbled with was being an architect. I kind of thought that, that that was exciting, and I spent a, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother, and she was really into like, you know, interior design mm-hmm. and things like that. And you know, I thought architecture was kind of um, was kind of interesting, and but that was it. That was the only other thing that I ev- I've ever played around with. And it lasted like three months. <laughs> it's also when you're ten, you're like, uh, why would I want like what, like an architect doesn't sound exciting. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I want to be an architect, and and but then I the math, the idea of all that math. But then like, it's, yeah, architect is really fucking cool though. It is. It's, a, it's an amazing. I, I, I mean, it's like, an amazing career. Like 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 now that I'm all I'm like shit. You know, like architects always have like cool glasses. They have like they're like yeah. the coolest oh, shit, always, the coolest always. fucking watch. <laughs> yeah. They just yeah. find like all yeah. you know, like like yeah, dope the, shoes. Yeah, dope yeah. shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's like like every yeah. architect for them yeah. high. Like like he one friend I had, he had a firm when I lived in Santa Barbara. He had like some crazy tricycle for his kid from Sweden. Like they yeah. find all right. the You're, best yeah, design yeah. shit. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know? But um, that being said, um, you know, you you wanted you were at that, but like. I'm just I gotta go back to like you're like could we tr- could drive four hours to get a mango <laughs> yeah, steam? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, honestly, true. Like true story. Probably, I don't know, thirty times. I, like we would do that. We'd sometimes we would take a weekend trip. We have like a a little bit of family just north of Toronto, and so sometimes we might stay the night with them or something. Okay. But literally, would just go to Chinatown, walk around, find like different sauces, and you know, at that time, like things. Think, you know, it was 20 years ago, so mm-hmm. like things like oyster sauce mm-hmm. and fish sauce were like super out there, and um, and yeah, we just buy different different brands and then just come home and like cook with them. And I had like a spice collection; it was all like alphabetical. <laughs> yeah, like, spice I like, collection. I probably had like 200 different spices and herbs. It was wild, <laughs> wild. <laughs> okay, so besides spices, uh, what else were you into when you were younger? Music, sports? Bro. Yeah, I mean, I was I was really big into track. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wish I, I don't, I mean, it would have been nice to stick with it more. Um, but I was so focused and I'm just the t- type, kind of person that like when I get into something, I'm into it. Um, I got really big into scuba diving. Um, that was really fun. Um, cycling, um, you know, I got passionate about, but I dropped everything when I started working in restaurants and I was just like, this is what I want to do. And like, I'm going to just read and watch the Food Network or t- t- cook, <laughs> you know, yeah, and that, yeah. that's all I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I grew up doing, do, in, you know, doing a lot of sports, played football, played basketball all the time with friends. Uh, and you guys want to come over and check out my spice collection? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, the, that was a good game, guys. You want to come see I, my tumor? Exactly, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. Yeah, I was a weird kid. Um, so you said you knew right away um, – what was your first kitchen job? Was, uh, 13? Uh, you were yeah. washing dishes? Yeah, so my mom got me these cooking lessons uh, at the at the kind of fine dining restaurant in, in Windsor. And um, it was like every Wednesday, and you'd go to the restaurant, and th- the chef would, like, show you how to cook three dishes, an appetizer, an entree, dessert, and then, like, he'd pair some wine with it. And I was definitely the youngest person by like 50 years for <laughs> sure like easily like everyone was like 60 70 retired and then i would just like sit I, I can't remember his name and i'd sit with this guy who's like 75 and we would just like he would drink and i would just sit there and like <laughs> just like talking to a 10 year old about cooking it was <laughs> like so weird i'm sure and uh, but, but su- such a nice guy and um you know at the end of it he his name was Gino. He he offered me a, a job, and he's like, you know, I was like, cool, yeah, I'm ready to cook. He's like, oh, okay, you're going to be a dishwasher. And I was like, all right, well, let me think about it. And I got home, and my mom's like, you're taking the job. What are you talking about? Like, you have to start at the beginning. I was like, mom, I've been cooking for like three years. Mom, <laughs> I got more spices in my closet than they got in exactly, the whole restaurant. Exactly, exactly. So she's like, get your shit together. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I uh, I took the position, started working uh, as a dishwasher, like after school. And um, and then like got to high school, figured out how to like get credits from from um, from cooking. Uh, it was like a, a, a weird like applied program that they that they did, and I just basically stopped going to school. And they're like, "Dude, you haven't been to school in like three months." My mom didn't know, you know, because <laughs> I was like working like twelve hours a day. And uh, and those Canadian child labor right, laws—they're yeah. much more lax. Yeah, it, yeah, super lax for sure. <laughs> 
I don't think I was supposed to be there, but uh, the restaurant's closed. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, and and figured it out, and um, I just started working and moved my way up, and you know they taught me how to like do a lot of prep, and then started working on the line, and you know you work on manger, and then you start working like the hot line, and then you start cooking meat, and I worked there for four years. They opened a couple other restaurants. I helped them open those restaurants, and by the time that I left, I was like running the kitchen basically. Uh, which was which was well, cr- I was like 16 it was wild um, but yeah um, an amazing experience for sure well so yeah so 16 you're running this joint uh, by 18 you had moved to Vancouver and working at a, a major restaurant what was that restaurant in Vancouver uh, West okay. yeah so he so <laughs> when I turned 18 I was like I, you know I could, so I had been working a little so I saved up some money and um, obviously still lived at home so you know I had a little bit of money and I was like okay told my mom like two days before I'm like oh by the way I'm going to Europe <laughs> for a month she's like what <laughs> and so like on my 18th birthday like I just flew to Europe and just kind of explored uh Italy France uh Switzerland or uh yeah Switzerland uh Sweden an amazing trip got back a month later or so and uh I had heard of this chef in in Vancouver uh he was the um uh, executive chef for Marco Pure White, and so I, you know, Marco was he's who taught Gordon Ramsay basically okay. how to cook, right? So Gordon yeah. trained under him, and I was like, wow, that's crazy! Like I need to go work with this guy. So I just was like, Mom, I'm moving to Vancouver. She's like, Oh, you got a job? I was like, No, I just I need to go work at this restaurant. So I moved to Vancouver without a job. Knocked, you know, basically like sent them a bunch of emails, called them. They're like, Okay, fine. Like come on in, spend a day with us. And um, thankfully, because I lived in Vancouver at 18 alone, you know, for a while, <laughs> leased an apartment, I don't know. And um, and uh, <laughs> he's like, so I spent a day with them. It was amazing. You know, it, I would say what I was doing before, relatively speaking, was fine dining. Mm-hmm. But, like, this was at a whole new level. This was, you know, if this was in a in the U.S., it would be a, you know, probably a two Michelin star restaurant, okay. maybe, you know. And uh, so the level of precision was so high. Um, it was really amazing, and after the day, he sat down with me, and he said, um, I don't know if you're, like, I don't know if it's because you're a good cook or just I was a big fan of Margaret Thatcher, but so I'm going to hire you. <laughs> but And, like, <laughs> straight up, and I was, like, I'm fine with either one. Like, chef, whatever you – that's cool. I like Maggie, too, you know. <laughs> like, <laughs> and that was how – and that's how I got the job. I, Holy and, shit. Yeah, that was the start. That That is – Probably a first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got a job because he liked Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if my name was Joe, I probably wouldn't I have got the job. Yeah, I know, and I um, don't know what I'd be doing right now. Because <laughs> that was really the the trigger for everything. So I was like, hey, Mom, thanks for the name. Um, how long did you work there? <clears throat> uh, just under a year. So he, um, so he ended up leaving relatively quick, um, and he went back to the U.K., and I, I stuck around for a little while, and the chef that took over was great, but mm-hmm. I was like, man, I moved all the way to Vancouver just to work with this one guy. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Is there somewhere that I want to work in Vancouver? And I had heard of another chef, David Lee, who is in Toronto. And so I called him up, and he was like, oh, wow, Wes, like, I know this place. Cool, you've been working in restaurants for a while. Like, you're hired before he ever met me. So I, I just flew to Toronto and started work like right away um, and uh, at, a, at a restaurant called Note de Penne. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How long did you last there? It's like a year and a half, I think. Okay. Yeah, it was a really, I mean, Note de Penne was a, such an amazing restaurant. It was, uh, it was huge. It was definitely the biggest restaurant that I still have ever worked okay. in. Served like 200 for lunch and like 400 for dinner, but it was, at such a high level. I was level. like, that's a lot of covers it's a for lot like of fine co- dining. And it is, I mean, the, covers, the check average was probably like 90 bucks a person, 80 bucks a person. Like it was like really high, maybe more than that. Yeah. It was really, like the way that they were executing was pretty remarkable. And so I learned so much there. Um, it was a pretty eye-opening experience of like how you can work with a team of like 30 cooks at, you know, at one time. And then they turn over for dinner and another 30 people. I mean, the staff was huge. It was, it was pretty amazing. The food was delicious, honestly. He's a great chef. And, what were, and so what was your role there? Um, you were working on the line, what was? Yeah, so we, I started, I came in, everyone goes to the Grand Manger station, um, really incredible. Worked with this, with, this, um, with this chef there, Anya, 
who worked for Robichon for a long time. Oh wow! And like she w- she's German and was just like, Whew. <laughs> man, yeah, yeah. I was like, you're definitely German <laughs> for sure. It was intense. Um, and then and then after a little while, like worked our way through and started working um, vegetables and, and worked fish and so. Um, really amazing. And honestly, everybody that's left that place is like doing something really cool. Pretty much everyone has stayed in Toronto, Mm -hmm. but they're all running like the best restaurants in in Toronto. Some went to like Noma for a little while or Central, and then they all went back and they're all leading the best restaurants in Toronto. It's really, really cool. Everyone kind of went through there. Wow. So where'd you go next? So I, so yeah, I mean, I was having so much fun there, but again, I was always like, I want to do s- I want to push myself. You, you push yourself. Yeah, I, you know, that's for a sure. Theme. Already, <laughs> yeah. we're only like 15 my, minutes my, in. My whole life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, so I was, after that time, I was having a great, I was having an amazing time, and, uh, but I was like, uh, what's next? What am I going to do? And I, Trump, Canada doesn't have Michelin stars. Why, why, why is that? I mean, there's a lot of reasons, I'm sure, but like, it's, it costs money to have Michelin kind of come in, and I just don't think uh, there, there, there's a big push for the, from the tourism side for it. Um, so yeah, they still don't have it despite they should, cause there's some amazing restaurants there now. Um, but so I wanted to work in Michelin restaurants Okay. and, um, I, so I looked all around the world of like, and kind of compiled the list of places that like, I really was excited to work, uh, or I wanted to work for. And I emailed up probably five people or so. And, uh, like, on the first day of me kind of compiling this list, one of which was Daniel Patterson at Qua. And they emailed me back like in five minutes. They were really, really fast. Mm. And they were like, can you come for three days? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So I took a vacation from the restaurant in Toronto from Nota Bene, flew out to San Francisco and uh, had an incredible time. And I was like, we, I, you know, I felt like I was working at a really high level. I felt like at West I worked at a really high level. And like this was, you know, so it, it was the food is his food he's one of the best chefs in the world i think he's su- such an underrated chef mm-hmm. um the you know like measuring sticks and like rulers for like for like you know this has to be like a quarter inch by a quarter inch mm-hmm. and like dicing things and it was polishing the stainless steel tops it was just like such a high level everyone ironed their chef's jacket and aprons before service and they switched it out like it was it was like a it, it was just it was a, such an amazing experience. I was so excited, and, and luckily they offered me a job after the three-day stage, and I said absolutely. So I went back to Toronto m- and moved to San Francisco. And I'm lucky I have dual citizenship. Um, otherwise, I honestly don't think it, I, I, it just wouldn't be possible. It's, imp- it's so hard to, as a Canadian, get a working visa in the U.S. for, especially in the like restaurant industry. It's it's almost impossible. Um, not, not after COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're like, come on, come on, come on. Come on. We, we, yeah, everybody's hiring. <laughs> Yeah, there's no staff right now. Yeah. Um, but that was – and so, yeah, I took the job and was there, and it was amazing. So I've been listening to all these stories about all these kitchens you're working in, and I realized – so where would you go? You go to the Culinary Institute CIA, Culinary Institute of America, the Culinary Institute of Canada. Where where'd you where'd you get your degree in uh, chefery? <laughs> chefery. Uh, I didn't. I, um, I I never went to school. I started, I started cooking so young um, that I kind of just weighed my choices, right? I can, you know – in high school, I, I ne- actually never finished high school. I, I dropped out of high school to, to cook. And um, I was like, well, I dropped out of high school, so I guess I'm not going to university. But, w- you know, <laughs> a, couple of, a couple of years prior, I was like, I could go to, like, the CIA and spend, like, a couple hundred thousand dollars, which I didn't have, which my mom didn't have, and then be in debt and then make $8 an hour like every cook does when they get out of culinary mm-hmm, school. Mm-hmm. And so, or I can just be like, well, I've already been working in restaurants, you know, for five years or six years or whatever, and just stick it out and just try to put myself in the best places that I did, and and that's what I did. So, well, you know, it's funny. Um, my guest last week, a guy named Mike Colomeco, who's worked in Michelin Star, he he would agree with what you said. You know, he went when he went to the CIA. It was it was affordable, and I think he had a scholarship. You know, yeah. something. But he's like, you know, like it's ridiculous right now. If you're a young person, you spend, you know, you're gonna spend hundred thousand dollars, and you're gonna make eight dollars an hour. Like yeah, you, you're yeah. never, yeah, gonna make it out of that hole. No. Um, I really love how just you just like you do have focus. I mean, we're talking about. I mean, like, holy shit! Like, you know, I mean, 
I was when you said you dropped out of high school. Uh, the, the big Eler considered a fool because I dropped out of high school. Well, <laughs> you were, yeah, yeah, uh, right. I, yeah, I don't worth, know if I'm on the notorious I, BIG level, but I, 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 well, I really, respect uh, that. Yeah, yeah, you, know, <laughs> you, you were on a notorious level or something here, bro. So you know, <laughs> kind of going on. Um, so, uh, qua, um, what, what, how'd that shape you professionally? Um, I became really, like really uh like a lot of attention to detail um i really just the way that they did things you know you we slept we swept the floor every 15 minutes mm. like to a t you need to like plate things take the way that you taste daniel uh patterson was an was an amazing taster and when i said he's one of the best chefs i think like because he's such an incredible taster like he would literally taste the sauce every single time you went to plate something mm. and you're like just used the same sauce 13 seconds ago he's like i need to taste it again oh it needs one more grain of salt and you're like uh, <laughs> trying to figure out how to put how one, grain of, one grain of salt and he's famous for that like two two drops of champagne vinegar two grains of salt you're like yes chef all right and then you don't do anything and he tastes it it's great but um <laughs> but i you know so i learned a lot there about about precision and attention to detail and then mm. that's where i started to see like you know, I started tasting some wine, and I, I had no idea what it was. Um, you know, white Burgundy or white Rioja, you know, the Somme. It's a small restaurant, so the small Maz would, like, pour, and I would be like, oh, it's delicious. I have no idea what this is. And he's like, it's white Burgundy, and I'm like, I don't even know what you're saying to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, I get the white part, but, like, yeah. that's it. And, um, yeah, and so I was just like, I, I feel really stupid to, like, work in a restaurant for 10 years and just have a completely closed mind <clears throat> about, what's happening in the dining room, what's happening with wine. And for me, I think the reason that Qua at that time didn't get three Michelin stars was because there was this massive disconnect between the front of the house and the back of the house. Okay. It was the pinnacle example of like, you know, that normal, that restaurant sort of like stereotype where you're like, I'm in the back of the house, like I hate servers and servers are like, I hate cooks. And it was just like divided like that. And I think if everyone came together, it would have got three Michelin stars. And I said, I want to own a restaurant one day, and I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that person. I want to understand what's happening. And I used like the analogy of like, imagine like working so hard. I think actually someone told me this. Like, imagine working so hard on a dish, and you think it's absolutely perfect, right? And then you send it out, and then the server uses a spoon that's too short to reach the dish. Like, how frustrating would that be? I don't want that for myself. Mm -hmm. And so I started learning about wine. And um, I just like everything that I do, just got obsessed and uh, couldn't get out. And I like, you know, I, I, yeah, I just, that's all I wanted to do was just like read, 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 read and taste. So I read that while you're working at Qua, you actually said, uh, or at the base, or not said, but you decided that you didn't want to be a cook that only drinks beer and doesn't care about wine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it's true. I didn't want – like, I was like – and that's all we did. We just drank beer, drank <laughs> whiskey, and, like, that's cool. But, like, I was like, I, I want to know more than this, you know? I want to answer – like, I want to know what pairs with the food. Right. So you, you mentioned white burgundy and white Rioja. Yeah. Uh, what type of wines, once you started saying what – what were you initially drawn to? Yeah, it's so funny. So I didn't even like wine. <laughs> like I didn't like drinking wine. Like I, I like I was just like this is cool, but like I can't drink a lot of it. I like the story. Like I just I don't know. I just couldn't do it. I could drink scotch all day long, but I couldn't get I couldn't like <laughs> sit down and finish a bottle of wine by myself or like half a bottle of wine. I ha I'd have like a glass and that would be it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was really intrigued by the taste and the story and the history of the wine, but it took me a little while to kind of get into it. But definitely fell in love with dry German Riesling. I think it, why I was fitting to bring the Keller for today. Um, you know, I remember, I remember, I remember being like, "Oh, I think this might be my first Chardonnay, like California Chardonnay like oh. I've ever I've ever had." I can't remember. It was like a cake bread Chardonnay, and I was like, "Oh wow!" For like thirty bucks, like, "Ooh, going for it today!" Yeah, right, right. And uh, I was like, "I hate this wine." <laughs> Like, I never want to drink this. And it's just, like, I def like from the beginning, my palate has kind of – it's changed, obviously, a lot. But, like, I've always known what I've liked. And I've always been old world, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. So white burgundy, champagne, northern Rhone, um, just burgundy in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> – 
what was some of the things you would you did to begin your wine study while you were at Qua? Besides, obviously, you know, fight your way to drink a bottle of wine by yourself. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, struggle through it. Yeah, struggle through it. I have a it. I have a picture. I went out and I bought it's fucking Corton Charlemagne. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna be able to do it. So when when what really started for me? So I left Qua, okay, um, for a few months to go help uh, a. F- a friend of mine who was the new owner of the original restaurant that I worked at. Okay. He came in as a, as a partner. So I went back to Windsor for a few months okay. and he wanted to completely redo, like redo the, the restaurant. He wanted to redo the, the food menu, the renovate the kitchen, renovate the dining room, everything. And he was like, I want your help with the wine list. And I was like, at that time, I'm like, I have no idea. And <laughs> th- there were like some regular guests that were, that were like, um, Hey, can you, can you come cook us dinner and do a wine pairing? And I was like, of course I could do a wine pairing. And I was like, don't know anything about <laughs> this wine <laughs> and um so that really for me was when i really started getting into it and we were we were renovating the restaurant and then working service mm-hmm. and i we were probably working six days a week uh, from like nine to one every single day and on my day off or two days off i would just go home and study for 12 hours and i would go to the it's the lcbo it's a liquor store in canada and or in ontario and I would buy like 24 bottles of wine because I didn't like drinking them. I would just open them all and mm-hmm. taste them. And mm-hmm. like, that was it. <laughs> like, give that, like give them to friends. Like my entire paycheck was, went to wine that I didn't drink. Was, so yeah, I don't know. It was, <laughs> I know. I, now I like wine. Now, well, uh, n- now well, I can drink a little But you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, but y- you had to do that to get to Keller, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, baby, right. baby steps. Baby, baby steps. steps. Um, so like you said, you started studying. What was, what was like your go-to uh, resource for studying? You know, I started reading um, the Wine Bible. I think, like a lot of people, start there. I think it's it's a great intro into wine. It kind of tells you everything that you need to know. Um, and then huh, there's a theme. I got you know, as I continued to get obsessed, I was like, well, of course, I need like books on you know, fifteen books on champagne and fifteen <laughs> books on burgundy that I've like pro- you know that I never read at the time but right. I needed to have them and uh so you know I just started getting in and uh anything the wines of burgundy or just any any book um really that that had a little bit more detail maybe about producers and I think for me that was always the one of the hardest things to gain perspective on was the producer like I can learn that like you know the the maximum yields in Grand Cru Burgundy and the grape varieties and mel- maximum alcohol, but like there's not there wasn't that many resources that were easy to come across that like talk about the producers mm-hmm. and like how those wines talk. We were talking about this before. Now there's a lot of wine books, <laughs> uh, and <laughs> but at the time you know there was some, but like it was that was challenging. But so yeah, and then the Guild Psalm site came out, okay, and like printed off every single like uh, study guide and like all of the um, you know other resources that they have and, and I so I studied that a lot and obviously wanted to go through the quartermaster sommeliers um, and uh, and yeah and I just that's that's that was my study technique and it by myself because in Windsor there's not even there's no sommeliers you didn't have you didn't have like a tasting group man of, of psalms no. buddy, buddies no nope. come no. over and I know <laughs> that was just me and drinking 20 uh, open tasting taste blind, 24 bottles you know yeah. I mean, <laughs> no people bring you a taste blind <laughs> just go like this close yeah. my eyes close and and close. Yeah. <laughs> I, I rallied up a few of the like uh, servers and like uh the owner to kind of get together to like taste some wines together and like try to study together but like i definitely like took it to the next level and they were just kind of doing it for fun um, it w- I don't know what would have happened. I went to Toronto a couple times to do some blind tastings, but there was, I think like at the time there was one certified sommelier in all of Windsor. Mm-hmm. So there's nobody to like, you know, study with. Yeah. 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 So let's talk about the quarter match psalms. Uh, you were 22 when you passed the certified psalm exam? Yeah. So I, um, yeah, I was, I was in Windsor at that time. Um, so yeah, basically a few months after 21, I went to take the intro exam in San Francisco, and then, like six months later, did the certified exam in New York. And um, at the time, you know, wanted to go down the the master sommelier path. After I think I did for quite a few years, and like really, really took like really studied a lot. Um, and then just kind of said to myself, like, one, you can't know everything, right? And would I rather know a lot about a lot of things and kind of have an overview of everything, or would I rather like really really specifically like dig in to the things that i want to drink and like no offense to like you know 
all like South African wine or Chilean wine. Like I just don't want to drink it. Mm -hmm, like I just mm -hmm. don't find it pleasurable. I know that I like Burgundy. I know that I like German Riesling. I know that I like Champagne. So I'm going to learn everything and I'm going to devote everything to learn about these regions because I don't want to be a master sommelier that when I ask them, which has happened more than many times, <laughs> like which of the 82 first growth Bordeaux's do you think are drinking really well right now? And the answer is like, oh, I've actually never had well, any. Well, I was going to say that's, that's – Something I, I, you know, I don't have any certifications, but because um, I worked in auctions and I worked at Acker, I was able to taste all these wines, these amazing wines. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, we look at, look at, you know, you, we live in this social media world and I, you know, I have an Instagram account and yeah. I've done well from, but, you know, wealth-ish, but, you know, there's people who have way more followers For than sure. me For sure. who've never had a fucking 82 right. first screw. Right, right. And they're just flagging their WSET1 thing. Right, and, right. You know, and like, I'm cool. like, okay. Yeah, like, good for you. Yeah. And, and, like, in and I have a lot of masters that are friends. Yeah. Like, mad respect. Yeah. You know, like. You're I've had a number on my show, and I'm cool with all of them. Uh, I, of I'm course. Not, it's not a diss. I just wanted to be the person that has an opinion about the wine because I've tasted it. Exactly. Or, or more importantly, I've drank the bottle. Yeah. More than once. Yeah, and exactly. And that's and that's another thing, too. Tasting versus actually sitting and get to enjoy a bottle. Yeah, yeah. And watch it uh, uh, uh evolve and you know and the truth is um sadly with a lot of this that high-end stuff is that it is a finite supply totally um and and um and you know it, it's you have you can be fortunate to fall into groups of people who have that the the, the means to share those and then they love sharing with people who get it but i, I think you know um you there's so much about your story already that just like i think the most important thing is for people is your drive and your will to do what you want to do, know what you want to do and yeah. then and then dive into it. But you know, I, I'm just hearing that over and over. It's a it's a it's a it's a through line, it's a thread through your story. Yeah. You know, like like I'm doing a wine dinner tomorrow night and I am pouring a South African wine. And I was like, fuck you, Thatch. <laughs> <laughs> but now no, but I hear you though. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. No, 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 for no, sure. No, for no, no, I mean, and and, yeah, and, yeah. and and the only reason why I'm doing that is just because um uh um, because I do want to take people a trip around the world, but I don't buy South African wines on a regular basis. You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. this is in like, and no one is, you know, it's a fucking sixty-five dollar bottle of South African. So most people right. are not going to buy that. <laughs> right. 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 So yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Right. So like, yeah. Um, so I want to give people a chance to taste something different. But sorry I, but for everyone from South Africa. <laughs> no, you're not this in South Africa. But 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 you make a very good no, point. I, uh, like, yeah. like like it's uh, what is he? Uh, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. Like like yeah. like to have a laser like focus, you're going to go much further. Um, you know, the term in social media is niche down. Like who are you? Exactly. Who are you trying? So like, I love what you what you do and, and your philosophy. You know, um, it, it's fucking great. Um, so you decide not to pursue that, yep. and, and you told me why. Um, um, because. And, and it makes a lot of sense. And for me, it was just like, I have a law degree I don't use. I don't need, I don't, I can't do any more school, man. Yeah. I'll, I'll just read my books and find people to taste with. And, you know, right. Cause they, when I, you know, I got into the business when I got out of law school, I was like, I'm not going, I'm not going back to any type of yeah. formal school, bro. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, I'm sure it's, I it's mean, hard. I, I didn't even like school as it is. I wish I could have dropped out. <laughs> Doesn't always work out. I was, I was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it worked out for Carlton McCoy too. I yeah, mean, he, he also actually dropped finished, right? But yeah, 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 dropped out like four times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but again, I think that's because you both had a passion, right? So that's right. another thing too. Um, so we also read somewhere that you were actually you said you were disappointed in, in some of the master psalms who gave up their 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 pens oh, during, yeah. during the scandal uh, to denounce systematic racism in the court. Um, explain that. <clears throat> Why? Like, I, that, that was my question. Like, what, what does this achieve? If you're the one person in the, in the court that is actually upset about this racism, what does you leaving achieve? Right. Right? You just leave every – You now you're just the – now there's nobody in the court right. that has <laughs> any right. issue with this. Like, stick it out. But fight, fight, fight. In, you know, influence change. And you just denouncing your pin that doesn't do anything. Like, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I, exactly. It looks good, right? Thanks for I leaving mean, us behind. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think – I mean, if you really – are listen if you're really i get it but like i'll just say it, it kind of reeks of privilege to do that right yeah you just walk away from the you walk away like, i mean i get i understand i do but it, it reeks of privilege right right, right. right to just like oh well because because you know what none of those people are hurt and they still they still they still no, got the same course. fucking job they got. yeah of course and like they didn't get they didn't call get, they didn't get kaepernick no no they, right no 
No, they were gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, for sure. No, it's just it, – it's one thing to protest, and it's another thing to just close your door and leave or, right. you know, shut the door and just walk away. Right. Right. And um, I think in, in those instances, be the person to influence change, not to just be like, well, I'm out then if you're not going to do this. Yeah. So that was my issue with it. Yeah, that's a that's a that that, and respect to everybody. But that there's that thing of like the change has to change comes from within within any anything. Yeah, totally like personal, whatever. Yeah, right. So you know you need people on the inside, and you know, so I I, I agree with you on that. So um, I also read that you were quoted in Eater as saying, "If I were preoccupied by feeling vulnerable because I'm a black Somalia, I'd lose focus on the things that need to be achieved." One hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, said, I said that. No, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I yeah, I've said before. I'm like, listen, it, it's about being the best. Some I'm black. I, I want to have the yeah. best podcast. I want to be the right. best black podcaster per se. I right. want to have the best podcast, right? Yeah. So I'm committed to my craft. But I also tell people like, you know, <clears throat> you also this is this is food and wine. This is not. Right. This is not. Yeah. 1940s, 50s, right. people spitting at you, calling the N-word, throwing stuff at like, you at a baseball stadium. You're, you're not yeah. – we're not really breaking a whole lot of ground here per se because we've been serving people since we got here. <laughs> right, right. You really think about it. I mean, I'm just like <laughs> – like in this – in we I got a I got a lot of requests for for like – be on this interview yeah, interview yeah like oh we want to like interview you blah 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 and i was like cool but like i'm happy to do that as a Somalia, and i will definitely touch on this topic but i'm not going to give you the story that you want because i can i don't go to a table and someone go, looks at me and says oh well you're like a black guy so you can't be a Somalia." you're like okay that's fine you can think that like I am, and so <laughs> right. like let me show you what i can do and right. at the end of your experience you're going to leave and be like well, that was awesome, right. right? I don't, like, why do I, like, that doesn't hurt me. There's, like, a lot of things that are, like, actual, like actually happen. Somebody slightly doubting you or maybe not and just, like, appearing to is ne never going to affect me. So I'd never let that stuff kind of phase me. Yeah. No, that's, that's funny you said that. That's how I got my producer because someone, because someone, everybody, I got requested. It was like, oh, we, what's it like to be a black wine professional? Like, like my Instagram went up, like, too fast. I mean, it blew up. Yeah. <laughs> it blew up, um, like, after George Floyd, like people are like, oh, oh yeah. my God, right. this, you know, and um, <clears throat> no, because a friend had me on a show, and I said, I said, I said, I can't give you the story that, that yeah. story, you know, right. I was like, you know, you know where I worked, I mean, because I worked at that store, you know, people like he must know why he's working at this store, you right. know, and I didn't know shit when I first started, but you know, I, I was lucky, I was very fortunate to work at a level where you know, out the gate, first few months, you're drinking all these yeah. incredible wines yeah. and, and be able to deconstruct it. So I, I, <clears throat> I get that. And, and then, uh, um, but you said, what do you think needs to be achieved right now in, in food and wine? What did you say? Did you have any? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, a lot, a lot of the things that I said to people, I think I, I think I had something. It didn't go anywhere. Like food and wine reached out, and I said, fine, I'll talk to you about it. And we had a long discussion, and I don't think it, it didn't go anywhere because – you didn't I, give them what they want. No, I definitely didn't give them what they want because <laughs> I said something along the lines of like, just because there isn't doesn't mean that's a bad thing. And they're like, well, that's not what we want to hear right now. And, I know, you know, I but know. it's true. I think you have to you have to ask yourself that question. Like, are black people being like, well, I don't feel like I can become a Somalia because if they're not walking around the street thinking that, which they're not, because like it's just it, it the, it's a bigger problem. You right. Know? That's my thing. I keep I've said that. I said I said it's 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 this not. It's it's that's the it's it, you're looking you're making something micro that's a macro issue. This is totally. a macro yeah, issue. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know. Yeah. And and um, yeah. No, it's so funny. I as I you look around and, and you see like in the, in the press, uh, kind of the stories they like to tell in craft. I I I don't find those stories necessarily empowering. You know. No, not at all. Um, not at all. You know. Um, who it is? Uh, it's a great uh, linguist, John McHorder. He works at Columbia, and he he always talks about he he says, you know, um, that book, he hates the book White Fragility. He's like, I don't, you know, like, you're actually making black people look like we, we, we can't persevere. And, and, and the right. exact opposite is what has happened to us. And it'll be like, we're the probably the most persevering, some of the most persevering people on the planet. Yeah. And then we have, have people, like, they have to tiptoe around and, you know. And that's the black wine guy came by. I used to be the only black person in the room and to this day you know like you know, there might yeah. be two or three brothers a couple sisters in the room <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean that's there's not many there's not many um 
But I don't know if, if that's – and I've always said I, there's nobody there's nobody at the door keeping me out, you know. Not at all. <clears> and I was like if the door is not open, I'm okay with opening the door. And that's my right? thing too. Like, yeah, I just, I'll just i just open the fucking door. I, I mean also you know? they're like, well, like don't you feel alone? You're like, what? They're like, no, there's like other people <laughs> around that, that I can talk to. I don't only talk to black people, you know what I mean? Like I'm just like I don't understand, you know. Yeah. But I think what's – I think a big thing that – I think that's something that just really needs to change. And it is changing and especially as it pertains to, to the wine industry – this infusion of youth is great. Yes, you guys are killing it. Man. I mean, like, there's a lot of young people that are just constantly looking at things, being like, "Wait a second. Like, I understand that this is the way that it's it has been done, but this doesn't make any sense. First of all, so like, what if I do this, and I do it the way that I think it makes sense? And I think with that kind of change, it's really, really positive for the industry. And you're starting to see like young people, whether they're making wine or young people starting a retail platform or, um, you know, whatever it is. And I think that's really exciting. And that's when you start to see a lot of change, you know, not just the old guards of the industry kind of holding a monopoly, if you will, kind of over it. And um, I, that's going to change. And, and the same thing applies with, with restaurants, too. You know what I mean? Um, I, think, I think the restaurant industry is becoming – really sensitive, which is hard because it's a it's not a sensitive industry. No. I definitely think that there's a lot of issues and I think that like we need to work through that, but we also need to be okay with like somebody saying you're wrong or you're you did a bad job, you know, or you're like you can't work here cuz you're a shitty cook. Like you have to be okay with hearing that. You can't like hear that from somebody and then go out and like say well, they said I was a shitty cook, so now I'm, I'm, I'm going to sue them. You're like, well, like, you know. <laughs> like, everybody's just trying to achieve something great here. You know, I don't condone a lot it's, of things you know that happen. It's t-ball. Yeah, right. It's because we started – because kids grew up – some kids grew up playing t-ball. When I was a kid, there was no t-ball. You could either hit or you couldn't. Right. And, and it wasn't – I mean, and <laughs> there's no <laughs> fucking participation <laughs> trophies. <laughs> That's incredible. I mean, participation. I mean, what the fuck is a participation trophy, man? Yeah. I, I mean, don't even want that. <laughs> I just want people to like work towards a, a sustainable future. Yeah, and like we all have to understand that there's gonna be these moments of like uncomfortable, like feeling uncomfortable. And I don't mean in like a sexual way, because right. like a, not that's sexual. That's not not, not, not that, no. discrimination. But I just mean somebody being upset with you and like yelling at you. Like I get that it's not positive, but it's you. You work 14 hours a day. You're tired. Like. If somebody yells at you, just listen to what they're saying and not how they're saying it, and then move on. Just be like, cool, after service, done. If you have an issue with it, after service, sit down and be like, hey, I don't like it when you yell at me. Fine. But then move past it and just be a better cook, and then you won't get yelled at. <laughs> now, you make a good point. I mean, because I mean, we, we were talking earlier about yeah, great athlete Michael Jordan. People, he was fucking notorious. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like people don't understand, and this is, I, I, this is also why I've said this before early on the podcast, like, that... <clears throat> When you're talking, first of all, fine dining is like the NBA or it's like Absolutely. any elite level. There's yep. only so many jobs, first of all. Absolutely. And they're going to go to the fucking best people. Exactly. So you got to be the best. And like Michael Jordan, was, he punched Scotty Brown in the face. I mean, like <laughs> yeah. he, yeah, yeah, yeah. he, he right. was – A lot of passion. A, he was a motherfucker, right? Yeah. He, like, he was yeah. mean. Yeah. But he yeah. wanted to win, right? So yeah. like if a chef is – he's like I'm trying to get a fucking star here. Like don't right. be bringing your bullshit here. Totally. You yeah. know? Um, yeah. And 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 I think I get like what you said. There just has to be an understanding of of the level you're playing at. <clears throat> Never should be disrespect or anything. But no. in the heat of the moment, they in, in in the in the heat of the battle, things happen. Said and like you said, you can go address it afterwards. But like, right? You know, even President Obama said, "You guys got to chill with this cancel culture." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, it's a slippery slope. Um, sure. Okay, so you know what? This is a good time. Uh, we need to take a quick break, um, and then we're gonna come back with more Thacker. Thatcher. Awesome. Yeah, it's really good. <coughs> I love this one. Okay. Okay, we're back. Um, so let's let's get into uh, Thatcher's wine consulting. Yeah. Um, so, like, wh what was the inspiration? How did you get the idea? What I mean? Yeah. So after um, after I passed my certified, um, I went to go. I went back to San Francisco. 
um, and, and started working at Cezanne. Um, and this was kind of in the, there, there were two Michelin star restaurants at the time and we were kind of working towards the, the third star. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I it was, it so w- I'm, I'm sorry, I'm no. going to you. Uh, were you cooking at Saison? No, I, I was. It was wine, so okay, I was, was like, wine. "Okay, so, so you like, made the transition." Exactly. To wine. Okay, yeah. So okay, I was like, okay. "Okay, just passed my certified exam. Okay. What am I going to do? How am I going to make this grade?" And okay. so, the other three restaurants in San Francisco at the time that had two star were Bennu, Quince, and um, and Saison. Okay. And so I was like, I applied for all of them, and I was super lucky. I got a, a position at all three, and I just made a decision, and I chose Saison because they had this amazing wine list. It was a restaurant like no other. They were really trying to look through their own lens and do something different than what everyone else is doing at the two and three Michelin star uh, world. And it was there that I had gotten to know some guests. And so I, you know, after Cezanne, I went to Tokyo for a couple of years, came back, helped open a few restaurants. And that's when I, when I got this idea and it, and it happened really naturally. Um, the, a couple regular guests that I had known since 2014 would come in and they would just, pick me a bottle of wine, you know what I like to drink, you know the price point that I like, fine. And it, then they were like, hey, well, would you also do this at our house? You know, would you help us find some wine? And I said, yeah, sure, of course. And I didn't think anything of it. She's like, I want to pay you. I'm like, no, it's fine. Like, I'm happy to just help you find wine. And I, then I realized that it's not that easy. It's not easy to build a collection. Um, it's really, it's annoying, like, to the shipping processes and where do I get these wines and are they, have they been stored correctly and are they real and all of this thing all of these things and I, I, I realized that there is definitely something while niche that like would be amazing to sort of um, you know help people in that process help them build the collection so I, I started just in a, in a purely consulting role and um, and then we started to expand the business a little bit more but um, that yeah it was just it was just kind of like a gut feeling it was weird for me to leave restaurants it's the only time I've ever not worked in a restaurant um, but I just there was definitely something that I just knew that like I could help with that was maybe not, it was a little bit in the market. Like it was a, you know, there are some other, there were some other wine consultants, but not really. And so, um, after coming back from Tokyo for two years, let's talk about Tokyo. You were in Tokyo for two years. Yeah. Okay. So what were you doing in Tokyo? So, um, I, (laughs) so I was like, (laughs) so I spent two years at Cezanne. We got our third star. And I was like, hey, it's been a while since I've like moved to another place without a job. Like that would be fun. No, I was like, <laughs> I was like, no, I wanna, I wanna put myself in another situation and, and, and like push myself again. And I was like, I don't want to go down the same path that everyone goes down. Everyone when they work at a three Michelin star restaurant goes to the French Laundry per se, mm-hmm. you know, and just makes these rounds of all of these three Michelin star restaurants all around the around the U.S. And I was like, I want to do something totally different. And since forever I had this very big interest in like sushi and Japanese food and, and I was very passionate about it and um, so I was like I'm gonna move to Japan I'll, I'll figure it out I'm gonna move to Japan I don't speak Japanese I'm but like, saying, do you speak Japanese now? <laughs> I speak ja- yeah I, I speak Japanese now okay um, and um, so I just, I, I just moved to Tokyo and um, I know it's it's so it's that wild, wild. I, I don't in retrospect I don't like recommend that for anybody but um, <laughs> so I had a couple contacts of some really great restaurants, okay. Dan, Lefervescence, Takazawa, that I had met the chefs before when dining in Japan, or they had come to Saison, and I, and I, you know, they gave me their card or whatever. And so I, you know, I reached out, I sent an email, and was super lucky to have a, a decent resume at the time. So they were like, yeah, for sure, come in for an interview. Um, there were some job offers on the table, and I chose Takazawa because, I mean, it was just, and just still is, like such a cool restaurant. It's a three-table restaurant. 10 guests tonight and the chef is the sommelier and it's just him and his wife and uh there's like a a sous chef and like a couple you know a dishwasher or whatever and that's it and um at the time it was like super high on the asia's world 50 best list and i was like this is definitely the place and it was also very wine focused and i was at the point where i had just spent the last couple of years you know working service at a three michelin star restaurant and i was like well, is it time to get back into the kitchen? And so I went to, I went, I took Mm. the job, started cooking and um, incredible experience. Japan makes like, you know, a lot of experiences. I mean, you can't work in Japan if you're sensitive, that's for sure. (laughs) (laughs) I I can tell you some stories. Oh man, it is intense. 
Uh, there's no HR department there. Um, <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, it's wild. So um, I started, you know, started cooking. And then and I, what happened like a few weeks in or a couple months in, like. I'm sorry. Um, cooking. What was, what type of cuisine did they? Was so it? they called it like Takazawa cuisine. So it's like this, it's basically, he's, he's traveled quite a bit. Okay. With Spain, Mexico, France, et cetera. And so he just takes all of his inspiration and brings it back and makes Japanese food, but like in his own style. Okay, okay, so okay. he does, it's it's really kind of artistic. He's like really good friends with Grant Ackett's from Alinea mm -hmm. and they bounce ideas back okay. and forth. So it's kind of, it's not molecular, but it's there's definitely some of those aspects okay, that are. Okay. Um, and so what happened was this, this table came in, it was like four Americans and they were moving back and they just wanted to celebrate and have a good time. They had like a pretty small wine list. I mean, it was a big wine list for the size of the restaurant. They probably had 70 or 80 selections on the list, which is pretty pretty sizable. And um, they came in, they wanted to celebrate, and they were talking to the chef because he normally does all the wine service as well. Okay. And they're like, he's like, one second. And he like, comes into the kitchen. I have like my chef's jacket and apron. He's like, hey, you used to be a son. Can you go talk to this table? Like, I don't really understand. He speaks English, but like not perfectly. Okay. And he's like, I don't really understand exactly what they want. And so I... I went in, I went out to the table, and they ended up, like, really going for it. Like, they did, like, their basically one table for the night was, like, what the revenue of the restaurant makes for, like, a month. And so he was like, hey, would you, do you want to just, like, be a psalm? <laughs> you, you know? And so um, I was like, okay, cool. He's like, and we'll, 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 we'll back whatever you want to do. Here, you, here's a budget. Uh, build the wine program. Do whatever you want. And we trust you. What was uh, what was what were some of the wines they went for that night? I'm just curious, man. Uh, they had 05 Coche Corton Charlemagne. Um, they had 79 Krug Claude de Menil. Uh, they had 99 Latosh. Um, 59 Oprion. Like they were, <laughs> no, they were. They had a good time, for sure. Um, Shit. Yeah, yeah, they had a lot of wine. <laughs> and the rule in the restaurant was you always had to pour a glass of wine for the chef, and so he was also having it. Yeah, great, I was, was going to say, yeah. A great yeah, time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, they were like, here's, you know, we can do this. We <laughs> trust you. Do whatever you want. And uh, it was so much fun. Such an incredible experience to, like, be running a wine program, not speak the language, and, like, serve. You, you know, it's so it was such a – I don't know. I mean, it's it was singular for sure. And they also had uh, a twelve seat bar across the street called Takazawa Bar. Okay. And um, it became this haven, and and, and and still is. I haven't been back in a couple of years, um, obviously with everything going on. But it became this haven where people from Hong Kong and Singapore and the U.S. every time they came to Tokyo, they would come to Takazawa Bar, and all of the expats would host their, you know, Hong Kong friends, and we would just, cr like I it would go bananas, crazy. I mean. Like, these guys would come in. We had some regular guests. They would come in with, like, six guys and open, like, 20 bottles of wine. And just, ev like, every night, we were just going through so much wine. So we expanded the wine list from, like, 75 selections to, like, 1,500 selections for this tiny restaurant. And, um, yeah, it was amazing. And <laughs> plus, Japan has, like, some of the best bottles of Burgundy that exist. It's incredible. They've just had them since the 70s, and they haven't moved. And they're super meticulous about how things are stored. Uh, it's really, really incredible. So what was, what was that like, man? Like, you're like, we're back. You're like, you're like, yeah, we're back. <laughs> that's got to be bananas. It was crazy. I mean, it, you know, it was a lot of responsibility. And it was obviously and like, how old were you? Uh, 24 or something like that. Yeah, I was, young. I was super young. In a country, you don't speak 24, the language. 24, yeah. could have moved to Tokyo, <laughs> I don't speak the language. Yeah. And I get to spend millions of dollars on wine. Okay. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. crazy. It was yeah. so much fun. Yeah. You, there's going to be people like, 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 fuck this guy. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, dude, I don't know. How can I be you? <laughs> and I was blessed. I mean, it's, it's some really, honestly, like, just the timeline kind of worked out, and I was really lucky to kind of get to where I, yeah. you know, where I was and, and whatnot. So. so how long did you did you do that, man? So two years. Okay. Um, yeah, we we you know started going down the the uh, the 
the grand award for wine spectator we didn't quite get to the you know three cups we got the the one the two before or the one before and uh you know we just didn't have we tried so hard we just didn't have there was no space no i mean space, it was yeah. a 10 seat restaurant right because you have to have basically like every great wine from every region of the world yeah right? you have to have a pretty fleshed out list yep. and like we did i mean we got like these really amazing bottles of there was a gentleman one of like our break most regular guest he 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 sold us he had like this m- amazing collection of australian wine so he had like hill of grace back to the 70s right, and just right. like some really incredible stuff keller was like basically free like it was so cheap back then uh there was Koch everywhere we had jaye um we had like what they called him wine papa and um he had one of the most incredible jaye collections he had been going to burgundy for 30 years and just had you know brought like just brought it back with him got it straight <laughs> from the domain it's crazy Richborg stacked up is nuts and um and so you know we had all these really amazing wines on the list and um you you learn a lot about yourself when you live in japan because it's a really sort of closed off um culture for sure um you learn obviously how to communicate to people that don't speak the same language and try to figure like try to talk about wine obviously i learned how to talk about it so it was fine my definitely i can speak japanese pertaining to food and wine okay. you want to talk about couches i don't like i don't know <laughs> like couldn't no idea couldn't talk about that stuff um and uh and yeah so it was it was a really eye-opening experience i have i've never drank better when that as compared to like it was i thought at saison in the in the in the heyday if you will of like going from two to three stars like my first day at saison like we opened up like a bunch of 80s latosh and you know 82 82 first gross all the time and like all of these wines it was amazing but when i got to japan i was just like wow this is a whole <laughs> whole other level of wine yeah yeah so <clears throat> after you did that after you did your time if you did hard time hard in time. japan <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, Sake gets to you. I know. Um, you came back to the United States, and yep. then that's when you launched the uh, wine consulting, or did you go back into another restaurant situation briefly? Yeah, so I, so after I was having a hard time re-extending my visa after the, after the two years, and so I was kind of like, you know, they were like, you can stay, we'll figure it out. So I could, I could stay and kind of have a questionable future, or I was also getting calls from Josh from Saison and being like, hey, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're opening these restaurants, we want you to come back, okay. we want you to op- help us All open right, So this thing. is when you came back to help them open these restaurants. Exactly, okay. yeah. Okay. So I came back, and um, there was a big transition at Saison, Laurent Gras, who has like been like you know an idol to me since when he was at L2O. He was taking over for, for Josh, and then they wanted to open these anglers, um, and so, you know, I helped with the transition for Laurent and helped open Angler, um, which was an amazing experience <laughs> opening such a, like, it was a monster of a restaurant. And, um, but yeah, that after, after two years of that, um, that's when I said, that's when I was like, I want to, I want to <coughs> create my own, my own future. I want to be in charge. I want to do my own thing. And I think that there's like really something here. And that's when I started TWC. Okay. Yeah. So, <coughs> um, so you've been doing this for a couple of years now. Yep. And and also with all your history with being a Psalm. So um, what's it like to acquire these wines and build these cellar? What is 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 it about the chase? Is that hap- what is what's 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 wine acquisition? Yeah, so I mean for initially so as I had mentioned, initially we started just in like a solely consulting capacity, right? Okay. Where we just acted like as advisors and we helped just make the process a little bit easier. So we would go out and find the wines for you through like our network um, or like, you know, we would just buy it from like other retailers. And then I was like, I don't love this idea so much. I feel like I'm just kind of like a, a personal shopper and I don't have any like, I don't have any skin in the game. So mm-hmm. like if the bottle's bad, like I'm sorry, but like you got it from that. We got it from this person, you know? And so I'm like, I want to, I want to like, I want to be more responsible. So I was like, I want to get a liquor license. And so we started kind of developing our mm. own. Like we started finding, getting wines from importers and things like that. And so, um, you know, that was really incredible. And then we're like, well, we were getting all these like last minute requests where people are like, you know, clients would say, hey, I need like a bottle of, you know, 80s champagne tomorrow. And you're like, oh, like I don't, I don't have it. Like I got to go out and like find it from somebody and be like, oh, you know, it's from like, it's there, like 
can you ship it? They're like, no, we can't ship it today. And so it was, it was just getting a little tricky. And I was like, well, what if we started to develop our own inventory? And so we started building our own inventory, which made that process a lot easier. And then it allowed us to top, to like tap into private collectors who are like, well, I want to sell this seller. And I, or, or we could get allocations from, you know, all of these relationships that we've had with distributors or importers for so long. And um, I use the Royal We because it was just me at the time. But um, oh. and um, and so then we started developing that. And then, you know, uh, about a year in, um, I was like, well, it would be kind of cool to launch like a boutique style website, like e-commerce platform, mm -hmm. because I'm really I love DRC and I love Kosh and I love Rumier, but there's also like other wines that I really like too. You know, like I like Keller. I, I like I want to be able to like have these wines and I want to be able to share them with everyone. So we, st I started just a small little website, and um, and that's kind of taken off. And we've definitely increased our inventory by like a in like insane amount in the last six months. Um, and then we also started the, the the import process, which you know, exclusive imports into California and whatnot, which we're working on. We just launched. We're just we're working on developing more now. Um, but that acquisition <coughs> is always the most challenging, and it's the thing that we spend the most amount of time on. I mean, just like anything, it's one thing. It's easy to sell, but it's not easy to find. And um, but it's it's so much fun when you do find. You build these networks with people, and they take a personal liking to you. And so they're like, yeah, I'll, I like you. Like, I'll, I'll sell you a few cases of wine. And, unf you know, the whole wine industry, and I think what people often forget and often why there's not, like, there aren't really, like, billion-dollar wine companies. Because everybody's solution, you talk to somebody that works in, like, you know, the VC world or something, or, or they're like, well, what if I just give you a billion dollars? Like, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, you can give me a billion dollars, but I would have to create margin. I can't buy a billion dollars worth of wine i mean i guess you well you, you couldn't you, it's like the entire in, like, yeah i mean it would be yeah you would have the whole market you would literally i would literally <laughs> just go on wine searcher and just type in every wine and just like buy 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 yeah, it's yeah. it's you know it's not a transactional industry it's still in a sense super romantic and it's all relationship based it's all relationships people do things not i mean obviously there's a lot of wealth in the wine industry but people don't do it to who's the highest bidder um, or who has the most money. It's just relationships. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's it. Yeah. So we put a lot of work into that. <laughs> he said, someone said, I'll give you a billion dollars. I was like. <laughs> Literally, that, I mean, that's what he said. No, okay, we <laughs> you missed we it, were right? having a conversation <laughs> about a uh, wine business, and he's like, I don't understand why he wouldn't fundraise a billion dollars. And I was like, I'm like, why? okay. Like, clearly we live in, like, different worlds. But, like, I don't even – there's no – no. that's so much wine. That would be – it would – everyone would go out of business. Yeah, I, I – uh, so <laughs> – It's <laughs> that insane. Is, that is like, it's a lot of but, Keller. But, I, but it's a, that's a lot of Keller. That's a lot of Kush. That's a lot of <laughs> Richborg. That's a lot of DRC Montrachet. That's not a, a lot. It's all of it. It's, li it's, it's so much. It's literally all of it. It's so much wine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's all the salon in the world. <laughs> in the world. And, <laughs> and salon. Right. Yeah. yeah. You would own the so, You'd own the chateau for, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I got, I got a couple hundred bucks. Uh, what type of services do you offer? It's a good question. I mean, the services at this point, um, we're pretty much retainer basis. Okay. Um, you know, we work with people more so. You know, we do events and dinners and things like that, but we work a lot on an annual basis because, like, it's hard. I mean, some we we've had some requests where where people are like, "Hey, like here's X amount of money. I just need a great seller of Burgundy, and we'll, we'll you know we'll do it. We can put it together." But a lot of the stuff that we do, things take time, and I think that if you're going to start a collection today or really sort of like iron out some of the the things that are in your cellar and kind of try to improve it a little bit, if you just go out, especially like right now, the market is insane. So if you just go out into the market and you are buying, you're going to spend like 30% more than what you need to. And if you just take your time, you develop a basis of like some really great bottles that you can have to drink throughout the next couple of years and you want to add to that. If you're patient, you'll find, you'll save a lot and you'll find better quality bottles. And I always tell that to people. I'm like, stop going on Wine Searcher and just like looking for the cheapest wine. Like there's a reason that the like 
03 Latosh from some person in like, you know, Florida is like a thousand dollars. There's a reason that that wine costs that much. It's probably low fill, questionable provenance. Like, take your time. Let's set some goals. Because it's what Florida, you puts it in proper <laughs> soil. <laughs> right. To, yeah. to low fill. Yeah, six centimeters. And uh, he's like, well, it's a good price. You're like, okay. okay. And so, like, take your time. Stop. Let's create some goals. What do you need right now? Right. And so, uh, you know, for the hundred dollar range, I mean, we, we, it's not like there are necessarily are the, the thing that we focus on the most. Like we started a little thing called TWC seller access. So it's just kind of like a, it's a, I don't want to call it this word. It's like, a, it's a wine club, if you will. But like, we're trying to really include like incredible bottles and things that like people aren't doing. So we cap the, we cap the membership. There's a, there's only a limited number of spots okay. because if you get a th- if you have a thousand people on your wine club, that means you need to find wine that's yep. made in a thousand bottle quantity right. that you can gain access to, which is like which again yeah. is if there's someone's making a thousand bottles, they're all around the world. You're right. not gonna yeah. you know, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. An, it's so hard to find, and so we we did it at ninety eight and one fifty. So if you have a hundred and fifty bucks, like that's something that we offer, right? Like every single month, three bottles, sometimes four of like wine. We're truly truly excited about, and that's drinking well right now. And so you can just sign up subscription basis and you'll learn you know we we send out the email so that you know exactly tell a story about like a personal story about the wines and then some facts and it's been it's been going really well and like people can find that and it's something that's accessible to everyone because paying an annual retainer for your seller is definitely something that is very niche and and only you know a select few people really need that level of service but if you're just like a wine lover and you want to learn more that's like definitely something that we can do Definitely. So there you go, guys. And that's all this information will be in the show notes where you can find information on that. Um, but regarding, like you said, that that niche of uh, seller curation, um, I would have to think that uh, what is like the intake process? Is it, it must be pretty rigorous. Like what type of questions are you asking when, when you're about to take on a client? Because like you said, um, it's not just the money because you're going to work with these people. Like You don't want to work with that fucking asshole, let's be honest, right? No, I mean, you need to, You there's a there's a finite amount of people that you can work with yeah. d- and just have the bandwidth to do it because <clears throat> it's really time consuming. People want to, people, <laughs> it's funny, people want to talk to you, which takes a lot of time. Yep. They just want to ask questions and like, you know, I, at like seven o'clock, I get like, 10 text messages of like wine lists yeah, exactly, bottles exactly, from people right. like what should I order <laughs> like what do you think about this wine oh this wine's really great and I'm like I get, all right I guess I'll have dinner at nine <laughs> and um and and so it's it's yeah I mean you 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 have to select who you want to work with because it has to be a match right mm-hmm. and like so we don't really work with California wine we do like some older stuff mm-hmm. like we've been like we have a couple clients that are really excited about like you know, 70s and 80s, 80s Napa Cabernet, which, you know, I am too. I think those wines are really great. But, like, if somebody's like, oh, I just want to buy Harlan and Bond and, like, no offense, like, you know, Will's a great friend and, like, you know, like all of these wines, like, it's just not our focus. Sure. And so that would be somebody that perhaps we would say, hey, if you're looking to go through your cellar and go from drinking, you know, 2015 Napa Cabernet and you want to start drinking Burgundy, like, cool, we'll help you sell that wine mm-hmm. and then convert that to Burgundy. We're going to be a great fit. And then you and then you taste wine together and you have dinner and it, and you build the relationship and you start to see that see their palate. And that's a, always a good match. But, you know, not everybody's a good fit. And I think it's a it's a weird thing to um, it's a weird thing to say no to money. Right. You're right. just like, yeah, I could like sure pay me but like it's got to be a good fit and i think it's you what you don't want is to have someone that you don't um sort of meld with nicely and then it affect others Mm -hmm. right the other clients Mm -hmm. so it's important to kind of so we ask a lot about you know what do you like to drink what are your favorite wines where do you envision this seller going uh what is your budget super important question yeah um because the it has to justify the price of like having somebody who kind of work in your cell or whatnot um you know we ask what is your drinking habits like like are you drinking like why are you building a collection some are building a collection for their kid um which is awesome i think it's amazing we have someone right now that we're working with and he's building it for his son and like the kid is i'm like wow, your kid is pretty lucky. <laughs> <laughs> your kid's got a lot of Romani Conti, sir. Um, 
uh, and, 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 and some, some are doing it just to drink and some, some are doing it because, you know, they, they, they love the history or, mm-hmm. or whatnot. But yeah, I mean, it, it, you, you can only have maybe 20 clients, yeah. right, at that, at that level. Mm-hmm. And so you, you, you might as well, you know, pick the ones that like are going to not be somebody that spends, you know, a million dollars in three months and then is like, oh, I don't need to have a need for this service anymore. Yeah. There's somebody that you work with for five years or 10 yep. years and really help them build their seller because it's a relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Very cool. So um, with the pandemic, <clears throat> I, you know, I know that a lot of restaurants were forced to sell off their sellers last year during lockdown. How did that affect your business? Yeah, I mean, the, the pandemic was a struggle for everyone. I think that obviously um, nobody knew what was happening, and I think that's still true today. Um, so we, 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 the, the pandemic was good for us. You know, we, we, um, we had two, we have three employees now, soon to be four. And uh, uh, we hired Noah just prior to the, the pandemic. And he was nervous, obviously. He's like, am I going to lose my job? It's fine. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll figure it out. And worst case, we'll just, like, move to another country or something. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, we, so we hired Noah. We, we used to work together at Cezanne. He was okay. the director of wine programs for the, hosp- for the whole hospitality group. And then um, right when the pandemic started, uh, w- a little bit after the pandemic started, sorry, we hired Courtney, who was the wine director at The Modern. And uh, which was cool because, you know, we were kind of tapping into the New York market a little bit more. Um, but, you know, and then because we've all worked in restaurants, a lot of sommeliers or wine directors came to us and were like, hey, like, we need cash. Like, do you have clients for like this or for that? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so we bought a lot of wine from 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 restaurants. And and it was like, you know, I mean, obviously I had an interest in it, but like, you know, I was like, I want to, if you guys, I'm, I'm asking you guys because I want to help you, mm-hmm. not just because I want my business to thrive. Right, you're not like, a vulture. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're here to help. And like, if you need to the create- The wolf ca- of wine street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, no, the pandemic was good. And that's, and we launched the website um, for online retail just prior to that, uh, like in, in like February. So like a month before like New York shut down and San Francisco shut down. And, um, you know, we started, I started adding and adding and adding to the, to the, to the retail platform and it started to gain some traction and to the point now where it's like a, it's, it's kind of, it's its own thing. I mean, it's going really well and, um, that's why we're hiring someone else and we're just expanding and adding a lot more really fun bottles on and things that we're excited about. Yeah, really cool. <clears throat> uh, what are some of the craziest bottles you've been asked to find? Um... Yeah, I mean, sometimes we get, sometimes like people, so you're, so like, <laughs> so like I'll get like four, like someone's like, oh, can you, like, can you get a couple bottles of, of uh, 45 Romani Conti? And you're just like, you're like, come on. Like, I mean, the last one sold for half a million dollars. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's like, I'm like, I can, I know somebody that bought that bottle. I can ask him, but he's not going to sell it what he paid for, yeah, you know, yeah. or <laughs> just like, it's like, you know, it's so, it's such a hard thing to be like, it's not going to happen because it's just like you, I'm, I want to go out and find it, but like, that's a hard, those bottles are so impossible to come by. And then the provenance of them is like, they're so hard to find. So you have to be patient. And that's why I was kind of like, we work with people on like a annual or more than annual basis because like, those things happen. You can't just like call someone up and be like, "Hey, do you have any forty-five Romani Conti sitting around that you want to sell?" So forty-five Romani Conti was a, was a stretch. Um, you know, Megs of forty-five Mouton. You know, we get a, a lot of requests, and you're like, "Well, if you want a real Magnum, right?" I mean, because like then I think <laughs> I can get you a forty-five Mouton <laughs> Magnum, <laughs> right? D- if you want a real From Magnum, the Rudy collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's uh, there's tons of magnums on Wine Searcher, but like a real right. with proven provenance, not an easy thing to find. Because how many were made? Yeah, yeah, I don't know, not many. I mean, I forgot who I read an article, but someone was like, "There's more uh, magnums of like, you know, '88 Petrus." In, oh yeah, for in sure. In fucking Las Vegas, oh, than there was absolutely. ever made. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would say I would say the ask for 45 Romani Conti was hard. Uh, we had a we had a hard one. It was. Um, we we did it. Uh, it was a hard one. It was basically in a week. They needed a case of champagne. The vintage had to end in six, and every bottle had to be ten thousand dollars. 
And I was like, well, first of all, wow, okay. so there's, I'm trying to think about what the fuck? there's almost no bottles of champagne that cost $10,000. Right. There's very few. Right. And so we were like, like, okay. Because like even like, so six, I'm like, so 96, 86, 76, right. 66. Right. So I'm like, we're going to have to really start at 66 because 96, like Ambonet is like 3,000 bucks, $4,000, $10,000 bottle of champagne, almost impossible. So we ended up, we ended up figuring it out and like, it was pretty crazy how we did it. We had to like, it was, we had to finagle some stuff and ask a lot of people. Uh, but we ended up like 66 salon and like all of this stuff. It was pretty amazing. But I didn't think that that was gonna be doable because even everyone that I asked was like, I mean, I'm happy to sell you 2006 Dom Perignon for ten thousand dollars. Right, I was gonna say like, I mean, I mean, like, yeah, I, I mean, it could be ten thousand yeah. dollars, but I'm like, you know, I obviously it will wanted, be at some point, <laughs> right? But I wanted to make sure that there was value and we weren't just like making it ten thousand dollars because like that was the request. So it ended up being pretty cool. We did 66 crew collection, 66 salon. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty awesome. That's pretty sick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so let's talk about. You, I read you have a private collection. Yeah. Uh, what are some of your favorite bottles in your collection? Um, yeah, I, it's it's honestly the hardest thing about doing having a wine shop is selling wine because it's like, man, I don't want to sell this wine, right. but I have to. Right. But I don't really want right. to. Do I have to? I don't know. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, the things that I'm always the the things that I always kind of, you know want to add to my collection things like uh Mounier de Bourg. you know i love i think i think their wines are incredible a lot of champagne like old vintages of Solos. like of course i want to sell them but like i don't because like they sell for so much money but like i don't want to like i have some 88s and 89s and stuff i'm just like i'll never find these wines again they're in perfect condition i just want to hold on to them keller for sure um his wines are amazing so i try i you know i try to find as much as i can just for for personal, um, I'm a huge, huge fan of Arnaud Show, the new wines that Charles is making. So like all the wine, like 17s, 18s, and soon to be released 19s in the fall. Like I try to, I try to as much as I possibly can hold on, like find that stuff and kind of put it in my own collection. I will because I think that he's doing amazing things. And it, uh, for me, it's not about like, you know, filling up my cellar with like DRC and stuff like that. It's just like, I'm not really interested in that. I just want to have things that like, I'm really excited to drink, like Gonon, Allemange, like old Jamay, 80s Jamay. I was like, I put, um, when I started the website, I was like, well, I need to put some wine on the website. if It's <laughs> gonna be a wine website. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna put 85 Jamay on the website and it's sold. And I was like, I'm taking everything else off. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Scratch that. I'm taking it back. So I did the same thing with Keller. I had some 09 Absurder and I was like, nope, never mind. Taking it off. Don't care. <laughs> Don't need to hang on to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's kind of, it goes hand in hand, right? You work in the wine industry. There's things that you're really excited about, things that are really passionate about and you hold on to them. Um, but yeah, you know, a lot of new producers like Le Show, Bertha Gerbet, um, you know, the next generation, um, winemakers in Burgundy. Um, I just try to, you know, I, I want to, I know that they're going to, they're going to go some, they're going somewhere already and you can see it in the market. And I want to, you know, I hope that like I was in Kansas city, uh, two weeks ago with somebody that I can only describe as like a wine wizard. He's like, <laughs> he's, it's incredible. Like it's incredible. It's like 90 years old and has like been buying DRC since like the seventies vintage. And the thing about wine, like you would be, be surprised at where some of these ama most amazing collections in America are. And they're like, in, like, like you said, in Kansas. Yeah. One time I went to some doctor's house in, in, in Ohio. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking $7 million seller. Right. Right. And like, and it's like, it's fucking Ohio. Bro. I know. Yeah. But he probably paid a hundred thousand dollars for that seller. Right. right? And right, now right, it's, right, it's right, like right. worth $7 million. Yeah. It's but, but no, that's so yeah. So, and I'm thinking when you said to Kansas, I'm like, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. So tell us about the wonderful Wizard of Wine in oh, Kansas. He's he's, an, he's incredible. He's a, I, and this was my first time meeting him, and um, it, s such a nice guy, and has literally had everything, and just was like, you know, pulls out like 1970 DRC Montrachet that he like had since release, basically. And I'm just like, wow. I'm like, I want that for myself one day. <laughs> like, I want to be buying like these producers that will like, you know, I want to like in 40 years have amassed like a really incredible collection. 
and not like I said, not DRC, just like the things that mm -hmm. are are going to be kind of at that same level in, in in a few years. And so, but yeah, he he um, we we yeah we had an amazing dinner. It was a, with a few friends, and it was a it was a Montrachet tasting, and um, there was also a bottle of ninety nine Coach CC next to like a bunch of other mm -hmm. stuff, which is incredible. But he was just so knowledgeable. Like it's. I mean, that's like the thing that he did. And, and throughout the tasting, he had his laptop in front of him and like five books with like maps. And he would, for him, it wasn't just like drinking, like some people are like drinking DRC Montrachet because it's like this, you know, $7,000 Yeah, because it's DRC it's Montrachet like, and I so want to say cool. I drank it and I'm, you know, I got money now. And He's like, which date did they pick in 1970? I was like, I'm like, I mean, I'm like, dude, you're, like, you're going way deep I don't, for me, bro. I don't even know if they know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a really humbling experience to kind of have someone that has had so many amazing bottles and just talk about them. Um, but yeah, he's, I can only describe him as the old wine wizard, he's amazing. That's crazy. So um, what was the bottle that sent you over the moon though, man? What was? So my aha bottle with wine when I was like in the transition period was, um, two th <laughs> so funny, in retrospect, I, like, that wine must be so wild right now. It was a uh, 03 Kool Aid Sauron. Okay. Yeah, from Nicholas Trolley. That was like, wait a second, like, this is wine. Like, wine can be like this. In in fairness, there's not a lot of wines that are like <laughs> Kool Aid Sauron, but um, you know, it just was like, uh, it was it was such a wow um, moment for me. That was, um, I think I had just passed my intro exam, and I just was like, wow. Like, I I don't know anything about wine. I need to learn. Um, been, I've been pretty lucky to have some pretty incredible uh, bottles since that have just like changed my perspective on how ethereal something can be. Such as? Uh, it's funny, a lot of people ask me like, what's your, what's your best red wine or what's your best champagne? What's your best white wine? And I think for champagne and for red wine, it's a really, really, really hard question for me to answer because okay. I'm just like, could be this, could be this. But the one bottle that has always stood out and I've had it once, and I was lucky last year I found one more bottle that's just tucked away, was 69 Vogue Musigny Blanc. And wow. it was, I, and maybe it was because I was, I'm so doubtful of those wines. I love Vogue Pre-71. I think those wines are incredible. Um, but I, the bottle, so I was in Tokyo, and this is when I first started, and I, was, I had mentioned like Wine Papa, mm -hmm. and I literally thought it was their dad, but now I understand why they call him like Wine Papa, because man, his cellar is insane. So it, the lineup was insane. So he brought 85 Jaya Richebourg, which is a once in a lifetime opportunity, right? And such an amazing bottle of wine. Maybe the rarest, um, bot, maybe, I mean, you could say like 78 or 59, but maybe, uh, maybe the rarest. And um, we, I was like, that's definitely gonna be the wine of the night, obviously. And there's, he's like, bring the 69 Vogue Musigny. I was like, I'm like why? <laughs> Like the color's a little dark in the bottle. The fill is okay, you know, but I was just like so doubtful of this wine. And um, so they opened the bottle, poured it in the glass. And in the, in the bottle, it looked a little bit darker, but in the glass, it just kind of like lightened up okay. as soon as it was poured. And I didn't want to talk to anybody for the rest of the night. <laughs> I just was like, just leave me alone. Like, I just want to smell this wine. It was so, it was so perfect. And I don't know if I'll ever, I don't know if this bottle that I'll have at some point in my life will ever be that same experience. But it was such a singular experience for me. And you never see the wine um, ever. I've been looking for since then. And this was, this was in, is since Tokyo. And so, um, but for me, that was like, wow. Like white burgundy is the, maybe the greatest wine in the world, you know? And I love red burgundy, but I think the more wine that I drink, I drink way more white wine than I do red wine. Mm. Uh, like personally, like <coughs> at home, I drink way right. more white wine, even though most wine dinners are red wine focused. Yep. But for me, there's something about an amazing bottle of, of, of white that just, it hits like nothing else. I have not had the opportunity to taste all these amazing white wines you've had, but I did have an epiphany at one point um, that um, white wines are actually more complex than red wines. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, I, they, they really are, yep. and particularly as they age. Yep. Um, and I love red wine, but and, and I probably still drink more red wine, but, but the reality is this was like, like when I was first in my, I was like, no, I, I, like white wine is really 
complex. It's an, it deserves so much more attention yeah. and time than people give it, and like. And like, and what we're talking about here, like Riesling, and then white Burgundy. I mean, I you know, you fortunate in that like you were the dining aspect of white Burgundy. Uh, get you in that world. I mean, it, there's such small quantities from these domains, and and they all express um, the place, but also the style. You know, the style of the winemaker. Totally. The style of the winemaker getting out of the way of his own self to express the place. I mean, it's 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 crazy. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big believer, and I see a lot of guys too, guys and girls that like you know have have drank some really amazing wines or have an amazing collection, and a lot of them all get to a point where they're like in a wine dinner you have 12 bottles and like six are white and four are reds and they they focus mo- even more and they're more excited about whites even though like today maybe we're in a struggling place of like new vintages of white burgundy based off of like how hot it is yeah um but like those older bottlings i mean they're pretty that's yeah yeah i'm with you 100 percent. yeah yeah Oh, my God. Uh, Thatcher, I'm sure we could talk for more hours because I'm sure we didn't even get – we could, like, you know, you can't tell all with the clients, but I'm sure you, know, you got fucking stories for years. <laughs> <laughs> A couple. Yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> tell everybody um, where they can find you, how they can be a part of what you're doing, how they can uh, be – you know, uh, they don't have to have a billion dollars to uh, uh, be a part of TWC. Um where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Instagram uh, or the website's all the same. Uh, so Thatcher's Wine Consulting uh, dot com for the website, or just Thatcher's Wine Consulting for Instagram. Uh, I'm Thatcher Baker Briggs on 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 Instagram, on my personal profile. Um, yeah, but anybody's welcome. I mean, whether it's you know you're a big collector or just a few bottles that you're looking for, you know, the site has it or the consulting site has it and and whatnot. So. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for coming in, stopping here on the way to Paris. Really appreciate it. (laughs) Absolutely. So much fun, man. Great personality, great stories. Thank you. Uh, Incredible journey. Um, Everybody, it's your boy MJ. Until the next time, cheers to the Mavericks, the philosophers, the deep drinkers, the deep drinkers, the deep thinkers, and all us wine drinkers. Peace. Awesome.